Can you hear me? Testing, testing, yeah. testing, testing. Testing. Okay. Um, if you want to move the mic up. Sure. Gentlemen, those need to mute your microphones, and when you uh, speak, turn it on back to the right. And only uh, speak from the mic to the left. Thank you. All right, we're ready? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Representative Alan Clemens with the South Carolina Legislature. Uh, it's indeed my pleasure to be with all of you here today uh, to take part in uh, this very important briefing. 
we are uh, here with the Committee on Present Danger, China. And uh, I find this topic to be a very compelling topic that we'll be discussing today, uh, in large part because of where I come from. Uh, I grew up during an era, uh, during the 60s and 70s, when uh, there was no trade relationship with China. Uh, the, the leaders of this country had made a, uh, a significant uh, policy decision that to open trade doors with China uh, at that time in our country's history would, uh, would be antithetical to our, uh, our democracy uh, and potentially very harmful uh, to us as an American people and to the freedoms that are unique to us in America. Uh, in fact, I, I was sharing a story. I remember the first time I ever saw a product that was made in China. Uh, it was uh, during the uh, late 1970s. I was about 20 years old and in Mexico. And uh, I was in an open air market and I saw a harmonica that was made in Shanghai. And, and it's interesting that that memory still remains with me because uh, I had never seen a product being offered for sale that was made in China um, and had to cross the border to do it. Today, um, fast forward by several decades, uh, and yes, I'm giving away my, my advanced age, uh, we are in an America that, that enjoys and it sometimes suffers from our open door trade policy uh, and as a result uh, we find ourselves in business with China. Um, we're here to get the rest of that story today. What, what, does that, uh, what does that business with China mean to the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans? What does that mean with regard to um, this nation and, and her citizens today and pro more importantly tomorrow? How does it impact us? Uh, and to hear that discussion and to consider those thoughts, we have a very distinguished policy, uh, distinguished forum here with us today. And leading that forum is my dear friend of many years, Frank Gaffney. Frank is the, was the Assistant Secretary of Defense under President Ronald Reagan. Uh, today he leads the Center for Security Policy and is chairing this committee on present danger China. And Frank, would you please take the reins from here and introduce this August panel. With pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, your help in enabling us to be here in South Carolina, as well as your leadership in the state when we're not here, is really appreciated, as is your friendship, and uh, I'm very grateful for both. Um, we are here under the rubric of the S Committee on the Present Danger China. I'm actually its Vice Chairman, Brian Kennedy, who could not be with us today, is the Chairman. And we are visiting key states in the 2020 cycle, uh, presidential election cycle specifically, not in a partisan purpose, but to essentially ensure that information about what we believe is the single most important, certainly national security issue, and arguably increasingly economic issue, and perhaps as we'll be talking about in the course of the program, public health issue of our time, namely the Chinese Communist Party and the country that it is misruling, uh, both to the great detriment of its own people and increasingly to our peril. We visited already the states of Iowa and New Hampshire with what we call our 2020 policy battle space threat briefing. 
We're here today. We'll be in Nevada tomorrow and in Texas on Thursday, and hopefully other states uh, critical to decisions that will be made shortly about the future course of our country uh, with respect to particularly the national security and foreign policy um, portfolio. Whoever the next president of the United States is going to be, the next commander in chief, this is going to be job one. And it is our belief at the Committee on the Present Danger of China that the American people are entitled to know before they hire that individual what they think, what they understand, and most especially what they propose to do about the present and growing danger from communist China. Just a word of background and then I'll introduce uh, our distinguished uh, speakers. The Committee on the Present Danger of China actually has quite a pedigree. It goes back to the early days of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Its most important incarnation probably was in the 1970s when one of its members was a gentleman by the name of Ronald Reagan. And starting in about 1976, that iteration of the Committee on the Present Danger began helping that public policy leader devise a strategy for dealing with that time's existential threat to freedom, as the president fondly described it, not so fondly, but uh, correctly described it, namely the Soviet Union. And just as you were saying, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the practice in that period was engagement. They called it detente at the time, but the idea under President Nixon and President Ford and then President Carter was, if only we make the Soviets richer, they'll be more benign, they'll be less threatening. And as you sort of indicated, uh, it didn't work out that time and President then candidate Reagan was very interested in seeing if an alternative strategy could be developed that would contrast with detente. He ultimately, I think, called it peace through strength. And it ultimately translated into rolling back the Soviet Union, not propping it up. He wound up getting a mandate to do just that in the 1980 election. He hired some 31 people from the Committee on the Present Danger to help him execute that strategy. Uh, one of the other people who helped him execute that strategy is here with us and I'll introduce him momentarily. Uh, but the point is that the rest, ladies and gentlemen, is history. As a result of the work in part of the Committee on the Present Danger and the policy makers that it supported, um, we wound up adopting a different approach and millions, hundreds of millions of people, in fact, were liberated and that particular existential threat uh, was taken down. Which brings us to today. I think as we will describe in a succession of comments and, and analyses, the threat posed by communist China is, if anything, vastly greater than was that of the Soviet Union in its heyday. And we're here to try to help policymakers of our time both at the national level, these presidential contenders, but also here at the state level, why we're so privileged really to be with you and to meet with the people that you've helped open doors for us with today, uh, Chairman Clemens, to have a conversation about both the nature of that threat and the incredible reality of how it is being underwritten by us. We'll talk a lot about that in the course of the program. Let me introduce at this moment, though, our first presenter. Um, he is a remarkable and very accomplished retired Marine Corps Major General by the name of Michael Regner. He became known affectionately to his troops as Iron Mike and through his 
time in combat and through his leadership um, in the Marine Corps, he managed to become, I think, really an iconic Marine general, which is really saying something. He has served in a whole host of capacities, um, including, as I've mentioned, in virtually every combat theater there has been in his uh, time in service. Uh, these days, he is a, a mentor to the Marine Corps, uh, a senior advisor to the Marine Corps League, and a member of the National Medal of Honor Foundation Board. It is a privilege to have him with us, and General Regner, the floor is yours. Uh, fire for effect, sir. Yes, sir. Fire for effect is uh, a great term to <clears throat> pass on to a Marine. Because uh, the Marine always says, first and foremost, protect America's seed corn, protect America's most precious resource, and that's the young men and young women that make up the armed forces. Uh, I spent 40 years in the Marine Corps on the active ranks doing just that, protecting America's most precious resource, making sure they had the ability, uh, if in fact our elected leadership put them into harm's way, they had every resource available. And that's why I'm, when I heard about the opportunity to present today to something as important as getting national security correct, getting the resources in the hands of those individuals that in fact have to take on and institute the policies by our, again, elected officials. Uh, I jumped at this opportunity. Now, uh, as a career military officer, it's always important to study the tactics, techniques, and procedures of any potential adversary. And whether you're a second lieutenant in any branch of the armed forces or a young private or corporal coming out of an NCO school or a staff NCO school, I'm very pleased that we study all of the, our different adversaries. Yes, we also are going to hear from brilliant people today on the cyber technology, the mechanical learning, the artificial intelligence. All of these terms must be known because as I frequently speak at either the <clears throat> Army War Colleges, Marine Corps uh, War Colleges, as I will next week, I always let them know that a true solution it does not have to be a kinetic solution. What you'll hear today may probably sustain any type of victory we have over any adversary because it'll likely be a non-kinetic solution. Now, in my recent past, <clears throat> I was the operations and plans officer for the Republic of Korea, the Combined Forces Command. And during that time, I was the plans officer, and of course, in that area of the world, Republic of Korea, you have to study all of the challenges, but you also have to study who is providing the resources to, in this case, North Korea, the DPRK. And everyone who's probably aware of the relationship between the North Koreans and the, the PRC, People's Republic of China, realize that they are totally aware of each other's capabilities. And although both countries have their own independence, they heavily rely on each other. Well, as the plans officer and the operations officer for some great Americans and our great allies, it became incumbent upon me to study all of the different skill sets. So today, when you hear a lot about the technologies of China, you really need to let that one sink in. As a military officer, <clears throat> I'm not concerned about expeditionary advanced space operations. I'm not concerned about a 355-ship Navy, because the Navy and the Marine Corps and all branches of the armed forces must work very closely together. I'm not concerned about the military skill sets of our allies and the American forces. I am, I am concerned about some of the technologies of the PRC and their ability with their unmanned aerial systems to go farther and farther and farther, whether it's space ops, whether it's unmanned aerial systems that can have extended range munitions or the hypersonic munitions. These are technology-based systems. I'm concerned about those. Again, the fighting spirit 
the indomitable will of America and our armed forces is not a concern I have. Now, where does this background come from? When I was first promoted to the Brigadier General ranks, uh, I went to what's frequently called in the, in the general officer or, or, or senior executive service ranks, you go to a finishing school, but this is actually called Capstone. And at Capstone in Washington, D.C., uh, one of my running mates was um, then Brigadier General Joe Dunford. And he said, we're getting ready to select which areas of the world we would like to go to for about three to five days. I said, I wanted to go to the PRC. It had an opening for five general officers, and I was the one Marine general that had a chance to go into the PRC, two different areas, and I actually went to their officer candidate school uh, in China. I also went and had the chance to see a little bit of their armed forces skill sets. I said, whoa, very, very open. We don't always open our officer candidate school or some of our resources to the PRC. They're here automatically in some type of, I'll just say, discreet manner. But when the PRC puts out every year or every other year their air show, much like the Paris air show or our own air show at some of the different areas in the United States, it's uncanny. The equipment looks so exacting to the American equipment. Now, that's very interesting, whether it's an amphibious tractor, an aircraft, a truck, a, some type of um, long-range artillery or unmanned aerial system, but they're very open about it. In fact, it's about a 200-slide presentation presented at the different war colleges that I had a copy of last year that I actually showed to the Marine Corps War College, and it was amazing of that type of equipment. That's on the military side. When I was the uh, a few years back, I worked in Afghanistan as the operations officer for the whole country. And in that time, we had a ring road that was under development around the entire country of Afghanistan. It was going to build, first and foremost, economic stability and security across the whole country. And it was a good plan. It's very tough under a terrorist threat to build a, a road network. And it was very similar to a term that we know of called the Ring Road Initiative of China that wants to reach out economically, but economically is, can be cloned or cloaked as a national security issue because through economy, you will have an, a, a, a level of security. So when the PRC wants to go to 70 different countries across the world and establish an economic base, in their Ring Road Initiative, it's very similar to what we tried to do in Afghanistan with our Ring Road to establish economic security. We wanted to establish security. We wanted to have medical and educational resources provided to the people. But during that time as the operations officer, I noticed that elements of the PRC were coming into Afghanistan and working with the Afghanistan government for the removal of precious metals, chromium. Because Afghanistan, uh, unfortunately, does have some security challenges, but every day we might see more movement towards security and stability with the Taliban. We don't know that. But what I did see, I did see engineers from the PRC in the innermost areas of Afghanistan working on trying to get precious metals. I noticed, though, after a year that most of them had been, had, were gone. It was almost like they did strip mining. And so for my colleagues on the table today, I will say as a military officer, a career security officer, I look at the diplomatic, the information, the military, and the economic phase of warfare and security, dime. What I saw in Afghanistan was a quick win and a quick departure by the PRC. And so for the audience today, I would say if the PRC does get in economically involved in a particular country, I have yet to see their ability to sustain any type of economic stability, which they will promise, military security, which they will promise. Now, in, in some of the 
littoral areas of the PRC, yes, they may have a new island tomorrow built from the different types of machinery, but will they be able to reach out, will they be able to sustain past their own borders? I'm not sure that I have seen, both in my trips to China, what I've seen in some of the military, some of the countries where they've established a little bit of economic stability and minimal, minimal military security that they would have the ability to sustain. But again, back to my opening comments, sir, my concern is some of the technology, the unmanned aerial systems, the great distances with kinetic, non-kinetic, uh, ranging systems and what they may do up in space in regards to military that will concern any military officer so thank you much uh, a lot for giving me this opportunity to just voice some of my concerns with the PRC and their military structure which seems to be in growing uh, by leaps and bounds every year thank you well and as you said general <clears throat> it does seem as though they're growing with some of our capabilities, um, enabling that kit to be that much more formidable. We'll, we'll I'm sure, come back to that topic um, in due course. Um, again, thank you for your service, sir, and for your participation in this program. Next, as mentioned, uh, we have with us an individual who played a very important role in the effort to take down the Soviet Union, uh, working as a member of the National Security Council under President Ronald Reagan. Uh, Roger Robinson served as the Senior Director for International Economic Affairs and uh, was really, I think, uh, one of, if not the central architect of the economic, you mentioned Dime, General Regner, the economic warfare component of the Reagan strategy. Um, these days he is uh, working in several different capacities. Uh, he is the chairman of uh, RWR Advisory Group, excuse me, the president and CEO of it, and the chairman of the Prague uh, Security In Studies Institute, uh, PSSI it's called. Um, he has been instrumental in doing the sorts of research that has really informed much of the Committee on the Present Danger, China's focus on the threat posed to us by the Chinese Communist Party and its various corporate um, manifestations entering in and benefiting massively from our capital markets. Uh, much of what uh, that has enabled is what we'll be talking about in the course of this program. So, Roger, thank you for joining us, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Frank. I'm in my capacity as uh chairman and co-founder of the Prague Security Studies Institute uh, with you today, uh, so I can speak even more candidly about the circumstance of today's meeting. Uh, I've had the good fortune to, uh, to speak at, a, at a, uh, several of the committee's uh, presentations and um, delighted to be in South Carolina today. And Alan, I want to thank you again for your hosting this event. Uh, China seems to have a limitless checking account. They go around compromising countries in their neighborhood, whole regions with Belt and Road, and continents if you look at Africa. So it's a question mark as to where this money's coming from. They don't really touch their $3.1 trillion in reserves because they need that mountain of cash to deter Western companies and banks from performing any real diligence on their financial situation. Uh, if they look at, uh, if you look at a pile of money of that scale, you figure you can just waive that particular requirement. And that's what's happened for, in my judgment, about 25 years now. Uh, they don't use their 1.1 trillion in treasury bills uh, from the US. So, uh, it is a question as to where do they seem to have dollars in this, in this uh, volume. You know, they don't have a convertible currency. That they shared with the Soviet Union, uh, whether it's rubles or RMB or their other word, yuans. Uh, these are not convertible currencies. So 
They are, have a voracious appetite for dollars. Uh, they occasionally run into serious liquidity problems, uh, certainly exacerbated by the coronavirus today and the slowdown overall. So the need for this money is very pronounced. In fact, it's an existential risk to Communist Party leadership. Now, where do they get the money? Well, our capital markets are larger than the rest of the world's combined in terms of size, volume, depth. And we have about over 60% of the world's liquidity in the United States. So this is an extraordinary circumstance as we enter the 21st century that we have the bulk of the money. We invented the international trading and financial system. We are utterly dominant in the economic and financial domain on this planet. They're playing in our sandbox, we're not playing in theirs. And they've been able for the past 20, 25 years since they entered our capital markets, the issuance of stocks and bonds, to pull out what varying estimates, Goldman Sachs says 785 billion in, uh, in equities, stocks alone. Uh, I've heard Rhodium Group mention $1.9 trillion. In the case of dollar-denominated bonds, it might be another trillion. So we're not talking about hundreds of billions anymore. We're into the T word, trillions, which gives you a good sense of, all of a sudden, where this money's coming from. Now, did they observe uh, the requirements to be consistent and compliant with U.S. federal securities laws? Uh, for example, do, they do these companies disclose their financials? like American corporations are required to do? The answer is no. Those financials are regarded as state secrets by China. They are not disclosed. Are they compliant with PCAOB, the auditing function, that all American companies, a third-party independent auditor, to make sure that the numbers are real? Answer, no. Are they compliant with Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley, U.S. federal securities laws? Answer, no. In short, China's receiving preferential treatment over their American corporate counterparts. That's not an opinion. That, that's a fact. Uh, there is no screening mechanism uh, over the capital markets. The United States never has been. There's no security-minded review uh, taking place. Look at our CFIUS structure, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, that was strengthened recently by the FIRMA legislation. Okay, it's not perfect, but at least we're taking a look at Chinese foreign direct investment in the United States to make sure that it's not contravening vital U.S. security interests. Do we have something like that with the money? Answer, no. Is anybody really performing due diligence on the nature of the Chinese companies coming into our markets? The answer is no. Have we allowed in egregious national security and human rights abusers among those enterprises? The answer is yes. And I can give you chapter and verse, if we had the time, on exactly what companies we're talking about. These are not opinions. This is just the way it is. So we have allowed this free lunch program to go along uncontested on a preferential basis. And for example, when we look at uh, the state public pension systems, we find a number of these bad actors in every single one of them, practically. I mean, Hike Vision. Uh, this is a company that makes surveillance cameras and facial recognition technologies you can see their cameras atop every few meters the walls of the concentration camps uh, incarcerating 1.5 or more million Uyghurs. Uh, Dawa, tech, Dawa Technologies, the same. Uh, Megvi, the same. These are sanctioned by the United States. They're on the Commerce Department blacklist, the so-called entity list. Even the parent company of Hike Vision 
is on that same entity list, blacklist, for national security abuses. And yet, they're in virtually every one of the 50 states. And I suspect, in, in, including South Carolina's. Interestingly, uh, we just did studies, if you will, or profiles of Nor New Hampshire and Iowa. Uh, who are the Chinese companies in their portfolios? Well, they both have AVIC. China a Aviation Corporation. What do they do for a living? Well, they make fighter aircraft. They make UAVs. They make the DF-41 ICBMs that has 30 minutes flying time to American families in every one of those portfolios, including the MSCI All Country World XUS Index, which is probably the most popular benchmarking international emerging market index in the world. And all of the other major indexes include them as well. We have, uh, as I say, but besides Hike Vision and AVIC, I could go through the list. ZTE, many of you have heard of ZTE, a kind of Huawei equivalent. That's there. State Grid, which is <laughs> the state electric grid operation, which is PLA. And, and so the list goes on. We simply don't have time to enumerate this, although we do provide profiles as handouts that, uh, that the committee will be happy to provide. But when we look at South Carolina, and we contacted the South Carolina Public Employees Benefit Association, a uh, benefit authority, I'm sorry, that manages the five defined benefit plans of this state, which is invested by the South Carolina Retirement System Investment Commission, they came back and politely said, sorry, we can't share that information with you. We can't share the list of companies that are owned by the public employees of South Carolina. That's against state law. And I could even give you uh, South Carolina Code 3440A, to be precise. So isn't it curious about that level of non-transparency. I don't recall another state in the union that has made it illegal to provide uh, that kind of data, which should be obviously publicly available. Uh, there may be another state out there that does this. They make it hard to get. You have to FOIA them. They're not anxious for folks like us to review that portfolio. I'll say that. But this one is particularly uh, sad to see, and we hope to make progress in possibly making a change there. So let's take a look, in other words. So the diligence here is going to be key. Even the Federal Retirement Thrift Savings Plan, uh, which is where 5.8 million federal employees have their $600 billion, this year is scheduled to transfer their entire international portfolio to the MSCI, All Country World XUS Index, that has the very some of the very companies that I've mentioned. Oh, and by the way, just as a sidebar, five US sanctioned Russian companies as well. Sanctioned. You're not allowed to do business with them by law, but you can invest in them and you can fund them. Now explain that, how does that work? We use sanctions to penalize companies being able to have the prestige to be in our markets is a reward, not to mention the funding itself. It's inviting them to raise funds from unwitting Americans. Are those facts disclosed to Americans at the very least? Answer, absolutely not. So isn't it interesting that we have never, I suspect that the people listening to this, to this video have not had one exposure to this issue. Not one article, not one congressional hearing, not one NGO agenda item, not one cocktail conversation, not one sidebar meeting with state or federal ex executives, including the interagency process of the United States until it was forced through embarrassment recently. So the point being, that why is that? And the answer is because this is the motherload. 
This is what China doesn't want you to see. They're happy for us to focus on the shiny object of trade. They can handle sanctions all day long, all year long. They've got that worked out, as we know. They don't like the technology piece because we're starting to clamp down on these militarily relevant technologies and human rights abusing technologies. That's a good thing. The Chinese don't like it, but they can live with it because they think that the Huawei thing will be reversed very much like the president reversed ZTE sanctions. They still think that they can maneuver that one. But guess what they can't handle, which is the, the, this topic, the capital markets and the money has never come to light before. It's not a subject of debate. It has been perfect from China's perspective. We're dedicated to changing that because two or three years hence, they plan on putting two or three trillion more in our markets so that, that 150, 180 million Americans, that's about the size of the folks that are in our capital markets of our fellow Americans, at least 150 million, they wake up one morning and they find 10%, 12%, 15 or more percent of their entire retirement accounts and other investment portfolios made up of Chinese securities. That's checkmate for China. They now know that they have a lobby that makes the current corporate lobby appear trivial. They have 150 Amer million Americans with a financial vested interest in making sure that there are no penalties or sanctions against China, independent of the severity of the offense for reason that it could damage the value of their retirement uh, portfolios and other investment portfolios. China's fully aware of this. They're counting on the fact that this stealthy activity will be the very checkmate that I'm talking about today. We have to come to terms with it. And it's not as though I'm proposing sanctions or something draconian or suggesting the delisting of all Chinese companies from the capital markets, no. If they just were to comply with federal securities laws, if they were just to comply with SEC regulations, we would largely solve the problem. We have to do something about those indexes. Uh, those index providers go over to China, to the Chinese mainland market, the so-called A shares of Shenzhen and Shanghai. They pick up hundreds of Chinese companies on, these, on their lists of index companies. Then ETFs, exchange traded funds, are built around those lists that are invested in by the American people. These are MSCI, they have $14 trillion in numbers like that of funds under management. That's where you get these huge numbers. So we've got to do something about the index providers and this drunken sailor approach to no diligence, no disclosure, just trying to pick up uh, Chinese companies because they think it adds greater balance and greater liquidity. I mean, they have a, f a formula for this. MSCI Emerging Market Index, I'll just leave you with this point, is today 33% Chinese securities. They've announced a goal of 45%. They have $2 trillion signed up to that index, but $14 trillion more mirror it, mimic it, and reflexively buy the same, you know, even though it's not official. So you have $16 trillion of funds under management right there that's going to be 45% Chinese. Now you can do the numbers. So next time we're wondering, how does China become a peer competitor with us militarily? How do they threaten the Marines that Mike was talking about? How do they have rail guns and hypersonic weapon systems and advanced mobile ICBMs targeting American people and five classes of ballistic missile submarines. In part, it's because the American people, in the case of New Hampshire, for example, 
fund China shipbuilding that builds the ICBM. It's, it's our money. And this is the most urgent issue, I believe, in the entire US-China bilateral relationship, bar none. Bar even military and geopolitics? No, no, no. It's the money. It was the money with the Soviet Union, and it's going to be the money with China. Thank you very much. Roger, thank you very much. It's great to have you with us, and uh, that corporate memory, as well as your analysis, is vital. Um, we're going to talk about some of the other things besides the underwriting of the military buildup of China that has been uh, made possible by our support, our financing. And it is a great privilege and pleasure to say we have a, a South Carolinian here with whom I have been associated for many years. His name is Ambassador Henry Cooper. He has an incredible a uh, resume of uh, accomplishment and service both in uniform of the United States Air Force and in civilian capacities, including as a civilian in the Air Force and as an assistant director of the uh, late and I must say unlamented Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. He also was uh, President George H.W. Bush's director of the Strategic Defense Initiative and uh, these days runs an outstanding organization, High Frontier, and is working here in South Carolina, among other things, on trying to protect our electric grid against uh, enemy action and other kinds of disruptions. Um, Hank Cooper is a great American, and uh, it's a privilege to say, welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, Frank, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hosting the meeting. <clears throat> Frank, I think the first time I met you, <clears throat> I was um, in the Air Force Secretariat overseeing our strategic and space systems, and you were working for Scoop Jackson. And you and Richard Pearl then moved over, and then we worked together on arms control matters. And today I want to talk a little bit about um, the arms control world as well as uh, getting to the space issues. I spent uh, five years uh, as Reagan's uh, chief negotiator in our talks with the Soviet Union, and my job there I like to characterize as finding creative ways to say net. Uh, this is one of the places we got enormous leverage, and we got it because American technology was such that the Soviets could not compete with it, and that played hand in hand with the uh, the work that Roger and others were doing as a part of Reagan's overall strategy, peace through strength strategy, rebuilding the military um, and, uh, and basically under, underwriting the systems development activities that made it clear to Gorbachev when, when he finally got there, when Reagan said they, you know, he couldn't figure out who to negotiate with, they kept dying on him, their leaders did, which was true. It was Brezhnev when we started that era, and it was Gorbachev after, I'm not sure I can remember the order, and drop off in Chernyenko, I believe it was, and then, then, and then um, Gorbachev. In any case, um, that is where we got our negotiating leverage, and it's why Maggie Thatcher has uh, on occasion said SDI uh, won the Cold War without firing a shot, which may be a slight exaggeration, because it wasn't that alone. It was the economic uh, issue overall that was the deal. Um, I want to talk about another aspect of this. Uh, I want to chat a little bit about how China is, uh, is now, I think, the preeminent threat. Uh, Secretary uh, uh, Esper in the Munich summit over the weekend said they were threat number one, Russia number two. Now, and I agree with that. I viewed that to be the case for some time, and it's largely because of China's exploitation of technologies to challenge us head on on a number of issues. And uh, I think this is something that we have to pay close attention to. 
When uh, Frank and I uh, were working arms control issues, one of the first things we worked on was something called the Sangus Amendment. Do you remember, Frank? That was, Sangus was a Massachusetts senator, senator, and he had sponsored an amendment that made its way through Congress that basically prohibited us from testing the F-15 launched anti-satellite system that actually I had overseen while I was working with the Air Force. And we were successful in getting that done. And as soon as it was successfully demonstrated in 1986, it was really an impressive thing uh, that caught the Soviets' attention because they couldn't compete with that either. Uh, Congress immediately then prohibited any further testing after that 1986 test. The Army tried with ground-based anti-satellite systems and, and they were blocked by congressional action as well. Now, during that era, there was a uh, co-orbital satellite operational system, anti-satellite system that Russia had. If you read the newspapers a couple of weeks ago, you saw reported as if it were brand new, uh, there was threatening satellites to some of our intelligence satellite systems overseas. Nothing new there. That technology's been around doing it for some time, and yet we still are not doing anything today to deal with this issue. And regrettably, I have to tell you, the President's budget um, last week, I think it was last week or the week before, came out, and there's not a penny in there for any sort of a military system in space that can, um, by force, protect our assets in space or our uh, Americans on the ground, for that matter, against the hypersonic threat, which is, everyone says, is a, the main threat now. And, and yet, I'll tell you that on my watch 30 years ago, when I was running the SDI program, we had a system then that we could do it affordably uh, from space, and uh, the technology of that era was capable of doing so. And it was blocked and terminated eventually when Les Aspen became the Secretary of Defense. And as he said, he took the stars out of Star Wars, which was certainly true. The sad story is that no administration since then, Democrat or Republican, has restored that. And even Donald Trump, who has come out for Space Force, which alleges to be a preeminent separate service, uh, to protect not only the assets in space, but Americans on the ground, doesn't have a penny in its budget to exploit that technology in that way today. This is a political reality, and I have to tell you that the Chinese are not paying any attention to this. In the mid-'80s, there was um, uh, a program that, uh, 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 that I was party to, uh, not really a program. Roger, I think you took part in the Independent Working Group on Missile Defense in Space. And if you want to go look at it, you can go to our webpage and, and you can find the report from uh, 2009, I think was the most recent one. And we talked about how the Chinese were really exploiting the SDI technologies which we had taken off the table. We fired the technologists who were working on the, those programs inside the Pentagon and dispersed the, those in the private sector at the Boeing Company and Lockheed in those days, now part of Lockheed Martin, TRW and Hughes. All those companies that were working those technologies were deferred and sent off to do other things. And as far as I know, they still are. So uh, China, during this period managed to get that technology by way of Surrey, which is a little company in England, and they have exploited it, and they now have capabilities that are superior to ours. Uh, as a friend of mine, Steve Quas, has noted uh, in, in talking about the space threat issue, we're playing catch up to China now. It is not a straightforward competition where we have equal capabilities, we are behind. And we should be frank about that with the American people. And the folks here in South Carolina need to understand that. And, and we need to redo, a re-over, if you will, of Reagan's attitude about these things. President Trump says America first. I believe that's what he wants. But unfortunately, the people that are working for him have not given it to him. As you may know, uh, Jay Raymond, 
is a Clemson graduate. He is now the commander of U.S. Space Command. If you have ways to get to him and shake his head a little bit and tell him to pay attention to these issues, it wouldn't hurt. You mentioned Joe Dunford. Joe Dunford, I've known him uh, and worked with him when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. We now have a new arrangement there as well. I don't know the new people, and I don't know how, how receptive overall they will be. Uh, General Hyten, who is the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, understands this issue. He understands the EMP issues, the former commander of Air Force Space Command, as well as STRATCOM. And if he's given the freedom to deal with this issue, I believe the Defense Department can do smart things. And that's not only to deal with China, it's with a whole bunch of other threats as well. But again, I agree with uh, Secretary Esper yesterday, our number one threat is, uh, is China, and we need to pay attention to it, and I hope South, Carolinian, South Carolinians will as well. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much. Uh, I, I did neglect to mention that uh, ambassadorial role among your other accomplishments, but uh, we worked closely in it. I shouldn't have forgotten. We are joined by another distinguished military officer, a man who um, is a helicopter attack pilot, uh, a man who has some 5,000 hours in the cockpit, a man who has um, led the National Guard here in South Carolina with great distinction over some 30 years of service, um, rising ultimately to the role of Assistant Adjutant General for the South Carolina National Guard. Um, his name is General Les Eisner, and uh, among his other accomplishments, he has uh, in recent years been the Deputy Director of the Office of Economic Engagement at the University of South Carolina. General, it's terrific to have you with us. I know you've spent much of your um, career focused on some of the technologies that we've been touching on here. I'd be particularly interested in your thoughts about what China has been doing in the space of cyber warfare, 5G, um, espionage in this regard and the like. If you would, over to you. Thank you, Frank. It's uh, my honor and privilege to, to be here today. Uh, most recently, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, made a comment. He said, the Communist Chinese Party represents the central threat of our times. Uh, Pompeo said this uh, just a few days ago in London uh, at the European Union. Uh, as the UK and other, some of our other U uh, European allies uh, are operating in guidelines dealing with 5G wireless <coughs> networks uh, with such Chinese companies as Huawei. Uh, and it's pretty dangerous, and I'll get into some specifics here momentarily. Uh, the, the good and the bad is uh, in 2020 and beyond, we live in a digital ecosystem. We, need, we, we live in the Internet of Things. Uh, we're connected. We have a global technology uh, uh, market system, uh, we, we collect daily uh, in, in bad and good ways, petabytes and petabytes of data. Uh, unfortunately, the Chinese, uh, the Communist Chinese Party, uh, do it in a very uh, malfeasance kind of way uh, where they will try to dominate either the Pacific Rim or do dominate the economic work market. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Uh, I have a background in cyber as well as economic warfare, so it blends well with some of the other presenters. Uh, Secretary of State also recently uh, has spoke to the governors. Well, why would a Secretary of State, other than having the opportunity, why would he speak to the governors of the United States of America? It's because the, in the cyber domain, uh, in the connected space, the Internet of Things, uh, the Chinese government is insidious in every state, every nook and cranny uh, around the U.S. and our territories. And he wanted to awaken the governors uh, to what's going on economically, a threat, a cyber threat base. And so it's pretty important. Most recently, we've seen uh, several Chinese military officers uh, uh, charged with uh, cyber breaches, hacking, uh, tied to Equifax and some other breaches. Uh, one of the military units is a numerical designation of 
People's Republic of China Unit 61398 is where they train. The Chinese communists have thousands and thousands of highly trained hackers that are going after our military and our business secrets. Uh, and we see that, witness it. We've seen the OPM breach of a few years ago. We've seen uh, Anthem hospital breach. Uh, we've seen the Marriott hospital breach. Uh, we're giving the, the farm away because we are not securing our data in this digital domain. Whether that data is out of Wall Street, whether that data is in the corporate America, whether that data is uh, within the DOD domain. Other people have uh, alerted to us uh, uh, when she was in uh, Ambassador to the United Nations, uh, former Governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, warns that uh, China threat uh, the formal, foremost national security uh, concern. So let's get into some metrics. Uh, <clears throat> about 90% of economic and corporate espionage in the United States of America is perpetrated by the communist Chinese. Well, what does that relate to in numbers. Um, recently, the Department of Defense came out and says on an annualized basis, that cost the U.S. economy about $600 million a year, and there's a loss of 500,000 plus jobs. Uh, not to mention when they're stealing uh, corporate secrets, intellectual property agreements, they're stealing our thoughts, our ideas, and our future dominance in the technology space. 50 to 80% of the intellectual property and patent thefts have been perpetrated by the communist Chinese. That's pretty substantial. Uh, we need to wake up and, and stop that. Um, General Rigner made a comment earlier about some military systems. If, if you look at a picture of a Chinese J-30 fighter, looks remarkably like the F-35 fighter. They stole it. We gave, we gave the information. Uh, if you look at some of the stealth technologies in the J-20 fighter, they stole it. Uh, how do we stop that bleeding so that we maintain our dominance uh, as the greatest nation in the world uh, in the face of an adversary that's got a long-term goal of one, dominating the Pacific Rim and really becoming a peer in the economic domain, in this digital domain we live in? Last year alone, the FBI notified over 3,000 companies that they'd been hacked. Uh, they're here in South Carolina. If you talk to the local FBI folks that I have a relationship with, they're here. Uh, and we don't know how to deal with that. Uh, the, the complexity of the chain of the cyber domain, uh, we've got to tighten up. Just recently, uh, the Department of Defense is starting to identify standards that all uh, DOD contractors have to live by to do work with the Department of Defense and the federal government, which is a positive step forward in this very complex world we live in. So how did this start? How do you boil a frog? You boil, you boil a frog very slowly, and we've been being cooked for a while. We just didn't want to talk about it. So when I was in the War College back in the late uh, 90s, 2000 time frame, uh, I had to do a regional strategic assessment on sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I thought I'd been punished. Uh, and what I learned from that is my early days of, of the Chinese intention to go after rare earth metals if you, in order to create dominate, dominance in a, in a spectrum, you've got you, you to own or control a lot of the resources as well as the technology. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, the Chinese started having uh, a large incursions, purposeful incursions into the continent of Africa where a lot of the world's rare earth metals exist. Well, what does rare earth metals have to do with cyber? The stuff that we make are silicone chips from, the stuff we make cell phones from, the TVs we make from, uh, part of the components critical to those functionalities are rare earth metals. Um, China produces currently 80% of the rare earth metals produced in the country, in the world, excuse me. Uh, they own 30 plus percent of the world's stockpiles of rare earth metals. 
Well, okay, so they've got, they've got some of the components that go into the systems that build the cyber domain. They also, today, uh, produce about 90% of the key components of all personal computers and servers. 90%. The cell phones, the computers that operate the, this building we're in. Uh, they also produce 75 plus percent of the cell phones and all the circuits that go in cell phones. So they've got rare earth metals, they've got, they've got the ability, they produce the motherboards and the circuit boards, um, and they've got the ability to maliciously leverage that to their advantage. And that's obviously, uh, back earlier I said, uh, when Secretary of State, uh, when uh, John Bolton made comments, when uh, Ambassador Haley made comments, they're concerned about the magnitude of the problem. So we'll talk to you about a little a story. Back in uh, late 2015, uh, Amazon was looking at to purchase some software capabilities that tied to video compression. Well, what does video compression have to do with the cyber domain and the Chinese? So they had had a contract. The largest producers are motherboards and, and servers in the world right now uh, is a company called Supermicro. It started in, in San Jose, California by a former Taiwanese engineer, uh, legitimate business company. Uh, they produce those servers and motherboards in China under contract. Well, when Amazon was getting ready to look at a software company uh, to do video compression, uh, they reached out to a company called Elemental. Elemental, another legitimate company, a company that built software compression data. And so you got Supermicro, the largest producer of motherboards and servers in the world. You got Elemental that's doing and building state-of-the-art software that Amazon was in the process of building what we now know as Amazon Prime. And so Amazon on their own decided to have a third party investigate the security of the components in Elemental software. Um, what they discovered is during the manufacturing process, uh, a microchip had been installed to create a backdoor access for the communist Chinese government to watch what was going on in these server, servers and motherboards. Well, that's, that's troubling enough that they had a backdoor stealth entry, but where did this other lead the path down. Elemental and this ecosystem had a legitimate relationship with an entity called Incutel. Incutel has a relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency. And so we're building hardware for government systems would comprise motherboards and circuitry. With, with essentially a back door so the Ch communist Chinese could look at what drone systems, Navy systems, Department of Defense weapon systems were doing and what we were looking at. That's the complexity of the cyber ecosystem and that's why we have got to educate our leaders at the local level to the federal level. Uh, we've got to tighten up the quality control of what we buy, who we buy it from, and why we, it, why we do what we do in a security domain, because we are giving the farm away. Again, economically, $600 million a year negative impact to the U.S. economy at loss of 500 plus thousand jobs. But as one of the other presenters just mentioned, a couple of them did, they are leaping ahead of us in technology as it relates to stealth. They're le leaping ahead of in a technology as really artificial intelligence. They've collected petabytes and petabytes and petabytes of personal information on people and leveraging their technology, they're now in a position where they can meet their strategic goals, which is by 2035 to have a modernized military and 2049 to be dominant in the Pacific Rim. Most recently, uh, the administration, again, back to Secretary of State Pompeo making a comment about 5G, is 
if you look at how the Chinese use uh, their technology to create an or Orwellian state where everybody's monitored. Most recently, we saw the doc doctor that came forward, uh, the Chinese doctor physician, uh, in his concern with the coronavirus. Uh, he was summarily monitored and shut down. Well, companies like Huawei, uh, other factions, they're, they're biometric capabilities tied to their cameras and other systems, is they want to export that capability, there's a backdoor access to the biometrics, facial recognition data, PII information, and so they're pretty close by. We've stopped it in the short term in the United States of America when AT&T wanted to introduce and start selling Huawei electronic components. But today, they're doing it in Mexico, just south of our border. They're creating 5G networks with Chinese technology. We've got to, we've got to step up, leverage uh, the technology the U.S. Has, has to bear, the talent that we have to bear, and create our own system that's secure so we can continue to leverage the talent and the technology that we've, unfortunately, over the last couple of decades been giving away. So it's been my humble honor and privilege. I, I conclude my General, thank you um, well, for your service to our country, which continues right up to this minute. We're very grateful to you for those comments. And, um, and the array of problems that you've just put forward that um, add greatly to the, the understanding, I hope, of what a challenge we are confronting from China here in the United States and with our interests around the world. Our last speaker is going to bring another component to this topic of the challenge, the present, the growing danger from China. His name is Dr. Sean Lin. I've been privileged to have him accompany us on uh, the two previous of uh, these 2020 policy battle space threat briefings in Iowa and New Hampshire. He is here today, uh, I consider him kind of a trifecta, really, for the purposes of these kinds of presentations. He's a survivor of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Uh, he is a practitioner of Falun Gong, a religious tradition in China that has been brutally persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party. He is also a veteran of the United States Army in which he served for some nine years, both as an enlisted man and as an officer, including, uh, thanks to his doctorate in microbiology, as the director of a viral disease laboratory at Walter Reed Hospital. He brings a lot to this party, in other words, um, in terms of his understanding of what China is doing to its own people which I think is always a cautionary tale for what they might be inclined to do to ours. Dr. Lin, thank you very much for being with us. Um, we appreciate your service to our country as well and welcome you to this program. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you, Chairman, for hosting this event. And I'm really humbled and great honor to join all of you here. Um, I, I took one and a half years uh, courses for international relationship. I just feel I don't meet any mentor like you in the classroom. Nobody talk about China's threat. Nobody. And it's really sad. In the classroom, they mention communism, just in one ideology about international relations series. And the classroom even celebrate the anniversary for Karl Marx. I was really stunned when, when this happened in the classroom, you know. So because as a survivor for Tiananmen Massacre, those images I can wipe it off from my brain. When I clearly witnessed a tank roll over people's head, when I first time see a student's head, it's just like plain paper on the ground. How could I forgot about the tragedy the Chinese people suffer under the communist regime? Yeah, I was just a freshman at the time, but 30 years passed, this memory never left me. 
And it was a clear taste how Communist Party can treat their own people. And then after 1999, 10 years later, another big wave of persecution happened, and this time to Falun Gong practitioners. And Falun Gong is an ancient Chinese meditation system, kind of like Tai Chi and yoga. So people doing just peaceful meditations and following guidance of truth when it's compassion and tolerance to improve themselves. But even such a benign practice, when it outgrow the Communist Party, the dictator in the Communist regime decided to crack down the whole group. This is putting hundreds of million people on the opposite side of the government. And one of the evil practices that's been exposed is they have, the Chinese regime has taken advantage of this situation, of the persecution, when they incarcerate millions of Falun Gong practitioners in the prison, in the labor, ca labor camps, in the detention centers. Now they suddenly have a huge bank of live organs. So Chinese government sanctioned a state-run organ harvesting industry. So they went to these labor camp detention centers. So they give blood testings, tissue matchings for these prisoners of conscience. People were really surprised. I have practitioners who came out of prison. They were surprised. They were torturing me the other day. Why they give me a full body exam? Right? What's the purpose for giving me a health check when you torture me? So only when the truth is being exposed, people were stunned because they're collecting this information systematically and build a nationwide database. So at the beginning, it was military hospital engaged. And then civilian hospital also joined in because of huge profit in its organ harvesting business. So Chinese transplant center booming after the persecution of Falun Gong started. And you will see on the Chinese transplant center's website, they advertise come to our transplant center, within two weeks, four weeks, you can get a kidney transplant. And two, three months, you can order a liver transplant. So this is a care on demand system. People go to China for transplant, it's like organ tourism, right? And they were really surprised. You can even order an operation date. So you know someone who will give you a liver on that day. And how did Chinese government do that? Because they can use the military system, they can use the judicial system, use the police system, all the system collaborated and go to a prison, go to a labor camp, kill one person, and then take the organ and then do the transplant in the name of saving the other people. So it's using the most respect, respected profession, the medical society do this evil crime. It's, it's really a, a stunning uh, situation in China. It was such a rampant business, state-run enterprise in the national-wide scale. So when the independent investigator, uh, human rights lawyer David Maters uh, from Canada saw this situation, he said, this is an evil the whole earth have not witnessed before. But this is just one example how communist regime treat their people. That's why it's really sad to see a, a policy change in the U.S. government in the past few decades. You know, as a, as a dissident, as a survivor from the persecution, it just feels so sad that um, a lot of the misunderstanding about the communism actually happened in the U.S. society. So, for example, people call, some people, they call them panda huggers feel like such a benign term. But actually what you are hugging is communist regime, communist party member. You are not really hugging a panda, right? Because uh, it's very successful brainwashing technology in China is to brand, it's branded the communist regime together with China. What is party versus what is the country? What is the people? They totally mix it together. So people are confused. So through generations of brainwash, Chinese government always tell their people, tell the younger generation, you must love your homeland. That means you must love the Communist Party. 
Any criticism against the communist regime is criticized China. And these ideologies are so spread out to worldwide. So that's why in the society of the academics, in the think tanks, a lot of people say, you know, you need to support China, you need to engage China, you need to open the door for China, you know, to let them engage to the world community so that they can pro proceed into a world with more uh, transparency, openness. But you forgot the evil nature of the Communist Party never changed. So when Dr. F uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote about the end of history in the 1989, they were assuming in the end of the Cold War means the change of the world order. But to communist regime, the Cold War never ends. They are very aggressively try to penetrate the whole world. So now we see such a whole threat from so many different aspects, from so many different distinguished presenters. You see the threat from military aspect, economy aspect, cyber aspect, right? That's so widely spread uh, existential threat from China because China has been waging this unrestricted warfare against the whole civilization, basically. And of course, the United States is a main target. So it's, it's really a sad situation when China's economy is so intertwined with the world economy. So you, a lot of the situation, uh, the, many of the government will hesitate to confront China. And I hope actually right now, in, people see more clearly with the outbreak of the coronavirus, because you see China's threat in the public health domain even more clearly now. People see the threat from China when they consider the information about SARS for about five months right, in, in 2003, and you see the epidemic grow into a, a pandemic situations and kill so many people globally. But this time, many people hope China learned a lesson. No, they didn't. They still have the same nature. They still conceal the information, and they s still silence people who voice out the alert that Dr. Li Wenliang's died, and actually triggered a whole uproar on the Chinese internet and social media platform. Because he was just an ordinary doctor. He's not even a, like a hero trying to break out the news to a whole community. No, he was just sharing the chat with his friends. And he got silenced. He got disciplined in the police station. And then he had to join the fighting with the outbreak, and then he died of the infection. So just this professional medical doctor tried to tell the truth to his friends, and he got silenced. And recently, also other similar situation, one nurse in Sichuan province, uh, she was just telling people on his chat room, saying, our hospital need more medical supply. And this little nurse got disciplined too because he exposed the shortage of the medical supply in the hospital. And other courageous uh, Chinese people who tried to take some uh, videos inside the hospital to tell the true situation, one of the persons see eight bodies pulled out of the hospital in five minutes. And this person disappeared now. Right, so Chinese government still in the same habit in concealing the information and they know the outbreak in early December, definitely, and they still consider it. And then in the mid of January, when the Chinese people was on the ce uh, celebration of Chinese New Year, when Chinese society experienced a huge high peak of the uh, traffic, the migrating population, more than you know, hundreds of millions of people were on the road. And they, and they closed Wuhan, but five million people already left before they closed down the city. So now this situation is out of control. Um, and Chinese government doesn't care how many people really die. Because it's just like, you know, when we see in the history, when we see about the uh, so-called the Great Famine uh, in 1959 to 1961, three years, more than 30 million Chinese people die unnaturally because of the terrible policy of Great Leap Forward and so many people were locked down in their village and they have to starve to death because the Communist Party did not allow them to go out of the village to seek help. 
And the same situation now, what happened in many other cities in China? Uh, we see many reports from China now. People just locked down in the home, and they couldn't find any help. And you see video people being tortured when they didn't wear a mask. So it's a humanitarian disaster on top of this epidemic. And now even more questioning, even many of the uh, scientists, uh, epidemiologists question the origin of the virus. Because the, the virus doesn't look natural. There are many clues that this virus is lab engineered uh, from the, the virus spike protein. There are five important sites that are actually uh, important for virus spike protein to bind to the human receptor. But four of them has very interesting mutations. And it still conserves the conformation for binding the human receptor. They usually doesn't happen naturally. And also one of the virus protein, the envelope protein, was conserved 100% when this virus compared to a SARS-like bad coronavirus. That doesn't happen naturally too, because the, the envelope protein was next to the spike protein. When spike protein mutated, there's no way, in a natural way, that another protein is 100% conservative. So there are a lot of suspicion on this virus lab engineered. So definitely people questioning about the Institute of, of Virology in Wuhan. And this institute has strong collaboration with Chinese PLA Medical Institute. And they are co-localized. And also, uh, this institute has the P4 lab, which was supported, built by the French government. And it was clear from the media report now, the Chinese government actually changed the design of the uh, P4 lab and even build more lab than what is on the contract allowed it. So there are huge military interest in, in building additional biological weapons in China. Whether this novel coronavirus is a bioengine a bioweapon or not, if it simply is a lead product from the laboratory, it's a disaster that created by the Chinese government. And now the Wuhan Institute of Virology is actually controlled by a major general of top bioweapon uh, systems in China. Her, her name is Chen Wei. So it, it tells the world more clearly that Wuhan Institute of Virology is not just a civilian academy institute. It's now <laughs> under military control. So there are more information uh, that the Chinese government still try to conceal. The expert from the WHO now finally entered China, but they didn't go to Wuhan. The Chinese government only allowed them to visit Sichuan, Guangdong, Beijing, not the epic center for this uh, outbreak. So what do they try to hide? Right? So the world clearly see the threat the Chinese government present to the whole world by concealing the information. And you can see the example in, in Japan. Japan followed w, w, uh, WHO's uh, guidance. Their public health officer didn't wear the protective gown, didn't wear the goggle, only a mask. And one of the public health officers got infected too. And they didn't know the true outbreak situation because China was not transparent. So the outbreak right now can have the potential to develop into a full-blown pandemic worldwide. So how many people in worldwide need to suffer because Chinese government's corruption and their secret operation? So it's really an uh, alarming situation. Not only that we didn't have a full understanding of the nature of the Communist Party, and it's so sad that we see we even have our money to fund it. We're underwriting their operation as well. So I feel this is really a very important historic time that we have this presentation uh, from so many different aspects to show the world the threat the Chinese regime and present it to the whole world. And I think it's very clearly we need to understand uh, the threat is from the Chinese communist regime. And it's very different from your many people's passion for Chinese traditional culture, many people for the ch Chinese people. The, the key issue is the evil nature of the communist regime. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lin. And thank you for that excellent uh, summation of what we've been documenting here. I, I did want to just add one 
anecdote to your list of uh, horribles there, it's reported that the city government of Wuhan, after it became aware of the outbreak, nonetheless allowed an event to be held involving something on the order of 130,000 people. Yes. A, 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 a potluck dinner, I'm told, and one can only imagine what was in the pots and what was spread about as a result. But it speaks to this uh, this indifference yeah. to now the people even in their condition. Now even reports on the social media from, from the exact community where they hold 100,000 people of a potluck dinner, the, the outbreak there was so severe, the government cannot even handle that community. Wow. Well, again, much food for thought. We're going to take a few moments now to uh, discuss some of the things that we've discussed in various ways and various levels in a little bit more detail. And um, I appreciate very much the, uh, the wealth of experience here that enables us to do so in a way that I think will be um, further enriching of this conversation and of the question to which we will ultimately turn, which is, so what do we do about all this? But before we get to that, let me just ask a couple of questions. Um, Roger, uh, we've been hearing from Dr. Lin about the coronavirus and the consequences, the devastating consequences it's having in China. Um, there are some reports that have been uh, emerging about the impact on some of our supply chains. Um, but talk a little bit about, if you can, what the impact has been on the economic condition of China and what that's likely to mean for example, um, those whose pension funds are being invested in Chinese companies that may well be now suffering some of the effects of this disease. Well, thank you, Frank. Um, China has very little cushion to absorb the blow of the coronavirus. I think that's putting it generously. They have a property bubble that is about as scary as any financier can imagine. They have a non-performing loan or debt crisis that is equally daunting in its scale if the real numbers emerged, which they haven't to date. The slowdown in growth of China combined with what is seen as a unprecedented 50, 100 million people in either voluntary or compulsory lockdown, and the fact that auto, auto dealers uh, and uh, manufacturers and every, I mean, a number of the supply chains, as Frank was mentioning, are now ha disrupted and are possibly coming to a screeching halt. All of this portends to what you continuously see is a precipitous drop in the quarterly growth rate of China. Very few people are talking about the annual growth rate, but I'll hazard a guess that it's going to shave 1%, 1.5% off of Chinese GDP before this thing plays out, particularly if it doesn't peak until, say, April. I heard it's doubling every 6.2 days in terms of infections. So the point being that if China starts to have that kind of shaving of its growth rate, it's going to make it very difficult for the Communist Party to keep things together. They are already arguably in slow motion economic implosion. They need a growth rate of roughly 7% to keep the overhead sustainable of 1.34 million people. So. As a consequence, when you go back and you remember that the MSCI Emerging Market Index is today 33% Chinese companies, what do we think is happening to the stock value, the share value 
of those 33%. I can tell you that it's falling uh, like a stone. And if you compare the MSCI Emerging Market Index against the MSCI EAFE, which is an acronym describing developed countries only, meaning industrialized democracies and the like, one is greatly outperforming the other, and yet avoids the bad actors in the human rights and national security categories that we're talking about that's inherent when you move into Chinese securities in the emerging markets. So not only are the American people being compelled unwittingly to hold these odious enterprises in their retirement and investment portfolios, but they're losing money in the process. Now, Wall Street's still collecting big fees, and they're happy as clams. But the investor is taking the hit. Uh, so I, that's what I would have to say. And as far as the states are concerned, coming back to the why we're here, I'd just like to say just a couple of quotes from Secretary Pompeo, who on February 8th appeared before the National Governors Association and said to, his, to the 50 governors, among other things, competition with China, and this is a quote, is not just a federal issue, it's happening in your state with consequences for our foreign policy, for the citizens that reside in your states, in, and indeed for each of you. He goes on to say, competition with China is happening inside your state, and it affects our capacity to perform America's vital national security functions. Now here's the one that gets down to something more granular. Secretary Pompeo says to the governor of South Carolina and others of his counterparts, I quote, I know you all have power over your pension funds or the people that run them. As of its latest public filing, the Florida retirement system is invested in a company that in turn is invested in surveillance gear that the Chinese Communist Party that uses to attract more than one million Muslim minorities. California's pension fund, the largest public pension fund in the country, is invested in companies that supply the People's Liberation Army that puts our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines at risk, unquote. And he goes on, and it is the case for many Chinese companies too, no Sarbanes-Oxley, their books are not wide open, so it's difficult to know if the transaction that's being engaged in is transparent and fair and follows the rule of law. And he goes on from there. Now, for state legislators, if you're looking for cover, if you're looking for a political framework to revisit your investment policies, and particularly your disclosure policies and lack thereof, you've got it with the Secretary of State, who's a very sensible guy and who used to run an outfit called the Central Intelligence Agency. So <clears throat> that's where we stand. Nevada, we looked at. Interesting, they only invest in the MSCI EAFE index, developed countries only. The rest is all domestic. Don't tell me that they're not getting a better yield than those that are involved in the major in the emerging markets. They are. And they've avoided the very problems we're speaking of. So please don't suggest that there's no way out. Everybody does it, therefore we have to do it. That's just not so. One correction I'd like to make from my remarks earlier is <clears throat> I said that the China shipbuilding company enterprise uh, was held by New Hampshire. No, it's, it's held by Iowa. <laughs> so what do they do for a living? Well, they build nuclear aircraft carriers and ballistic missile submarines equipped with ICBMs. So the Iowans have something to think about there. 
uh, just like I'm sure the South Carolinians will when and if we ever see the constituent companies in their public retirement funds. And, and finally, <coughs> you know, there's the issue of sovereign bonds. China wants to come with just straight up government bond sales, what I call anti-liberty bonds, <laughs> just to fund the Chinese government so that they can get on with the organ harvesting and other odious activities that we've heard about today, not to mention the military buildup. So this is a complicated, very voluminous subject, but I'm delighted we've chipped away at it in a non-trivial way today. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, Generals Regner and Eisner, Eisner you have um, made similar points on, on something that I think we ought to develop a little bit further. Um, you spoke, uh, General, about the frog boiling uh, slowly but incrementally. Um, that's kind of the way I see this whole engagement business. Um, it has become worse and worse over time as we've become more and more dependent on China for various things, and you enumerated some of them. One, one you didn't mention, but I wonder if you've been following uh, one of our colleagues on the Committee on the Present Danger of China is uh, Rosemary Gibson, who co-authored a book called China RX, which has talked about how we have now become dependent upon communist China for virtually all of our prescription drugs. In the case of generics, the finished products, in the case of most of the brand name uh, pharmaceuticals, at least the active ingredients, the key components. This has military and national security implications, of course, as well as public health. Um, would you talk a little bit about the dependence on these supply chains and the inadvisability, particularly, of, of, of this one? Uh, great point. <clears throat> uh, something on a magnitude of 80, 85% of the non-biologics uh, medicines that the Department of Defense dispenses to soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, in peacetime and in combat are produced by our, our friends, the Chinese. Um, and so we don't immediately have uh, backup capabilities because we've outsourced uh, that capability. Uh, what are the implications from a quality con control standpoint, uh, from a litany of standpoints, uh, from w with a, a f an armed force that's going against a, a, an adversary uh, when we don't have enough medicines to support the forces? Um, we, we Americans um, have gotten over the last couple of decades, we get convenience and security confused. Uh, we want to have immediate gratifications and we do not want to accept the consequences to secure stuff. Uh, I mentioned earlier about um, uh, rare earth metals uh, and I mentioned the story of uh, uh, the micro company that builds servers and, and motherboards. Um, but for years we've known that we could not assuredly uh, prove that chips and components going into weapon systems were what they said they were. Uh, there were technologies and there's still technologies uh, to increase the assurance that the chip we're putting in a missile guided systems or a GPS system is what it is. Uh, and there have been have some strides being made in that, things like uh, putting plant DNA in the chip and that sort of, sort of thing. And, and some of the defense contractors have reduced uh, their supply chain from used to be 70 sources of chip production, now they're down to 10 or 12. But the reality of it is, back to my earlier comment, when they produce 90% of the PCs uh, and 75% of the cell phones, and cell phones are no longer um, a phone in our age group. It's really a portal to the Internet of Things. Uh, it, it's, it, you, you no longer really need a bank. You don't really, you don't really need a mortgage company. You just need your cell phone. So 
we have to come to grips, and I think that's what Secretary of State, I think that's what uh, uh, Ambassador Haley, uh, others have said. We got to get a grip and realize that our supply chain uh, is critically at risk, and how do we restore that capability? Um, and and that's going to take a little bit of pain. And if there's any if there's any goodness in the current potential pandemic, it will heighten leadership in the military and the civil sector to go holy mackerel. Uh, we've got a nation that builds a lot of our stuff. I was recently in a discussion with a, a PhD from Georgia Tech, and we're already seeing downturn in chip production in China, even though they won't release how many people are sick, but we're already seeing immediate impact in production. Well, what does that mean? It means we can't commercially go sell those products. Apple phones, Android phones are gonna be impacted. So we've got, we just got to realize that, that our supply chain is at risk, and how do we build, build in redundancy? Amen. Um, General Regner, let me ask you about um, one other aspect of this. That, uh, could you talk, as a man with considerable time in, uh, in the headquarters as well as in the field of the United States Marine Corps, about what it means if, for example, the Chinese are able to rip off, essentially, lock, stock, and barrel um, the technology for the F-35 or for an LCAC um, air cushion landing vehicle or for, you know, uh, main battle tanks or anything else. That um, what does that translate into in terms of not only improvements in the qualitative uh, aspects of the threat they pose to us, but also um, the savings that they're achieving by being able to uh, essentially skip the whole R&D phase, which we have to painfully go through and at great cost. Uh, number one, th thank you, General. Uh, as uh, Before I go to Frank's uh, very important question, because it deals with security, again, of our most precious resource in America, but I want to say how much the federal government of the United States has had to rely on the military bases. For example, at Camp Pendleton and Miramar, how we've, we always open our arms to every country in the world. And in this case, we've opened our arms to our own, uh, whether it's from a cruise ship or from an airline, and how the thunderous applause of the American medical society and community on those military bases welcomes those individuals. But uh, you brought up very good points there on the medical side. And and I must be honest, every time I have done a humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, host nation support, and I've been in combat, I've always worried about who else is in the medical arena other than true patients. We have green on green. We have issues in every country in the world we try to provide stability to, but what and who and what resource do they have on them? So we've always got to be aware of that. And I like to tell you that every time we we bring in individuals, there are just all true great people that want help. Well, in some cases, some of them have the ability to listen, to tap in. The first time I went to the PRC back in 2005, within seconds of uh, the wheels landing on our aircraft, I got a note on my Blackberry then from the PRC. That night when we went out to a formal state dinner and everybody knew that your bags would be opened, no matter how well you put that little hair, that little piece of tape, that turn, they'll figure it out. They're masters at it. And I'll just tell you, there, there are a lot of countries that are masters at <clears throat> reverse technology and engineering and no matter how many tamper-proof products we have in america some people can do a very good job with it so sir to your question uh great question and my first concern is if the enemy knows the thickness of the door of a light armored vehicle a amphibious combat vehicle, the thickness, the gauge, the metallology of that, they can defeat it with some type of system. That's the real issue. You go back, unfortunately, to when the Iranians 
figured out the gauge of some of the mine resistant armor protected vehicles and the armor protected Humvees and how that blast focus type design explosive formed penetrator would go right through the metal on a door killing everyone inside because they knew our technology. So the question that how I would answer that sir that if if the technology of our military equipment even if it's as simple as the metallology on a door is it fiberboard is it is it ceramic is it pure metal if they know that they'll defeat again our most precious resource so we've got to protect these different um, assets and I'd like to say that every piece of machinery and equipment we use um, in America today in the defense department and in the defense industry does not have to rely on any type of technology from the PRC, that would be a false statement on my part because I know they do. And it's up to our elected officials to make sure that when they say, in the, in the macro sense, buy America, okay, buy America, but ensure the first level of technology in that product is from America. I don't, I'm not making a political statement. I just want to politically protect the Americans and our allies when we have so many different products that we share uh, in, in the military arena and in the medical arena as per the dialogue that went on. Because if you go to Walter Reed National Military Center and you take a look at some of the technology that is being used to operate on our service members and their families, is it all made in America? Is it built in America? And what type of security parameters have we built around that to ensure that it, there's not, there, no one is trying to tap into our information base? And I can't really say with assurance that that's taking place. Right. Thank you for the question, sir. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Cooper, you've spent a lifetime on uh, nuclear forces as well as um, space technologies and missile defenses. I wondered if you might um, give us a sense of what the Chinese have been doing with respect to their nuclear forces, um, how much we know about it, uh, for one thing, and some of the um, telltales as to the level of investment and the determination with which they're pursuing such weaponry um, that we've seen, for example, in something called the Underground Great Wall. Well, Frank, a number of years ago, <clears throat> I guess it was 93, when I was, um, I don't know, recovering from my <laughs> to last tour in the Pentagon, I took a trip to China, and I went into, uh, in Beijing, to the, uh, you know, the great whatever center there, and they took us on a tour underground, um, and... Um, we went down two levels, and they told us there was a third level down. And the way that was built was by hand. I don't know, you, I don't know whether you can verify it or not. This was sort of on the heels of uh, Tiananmen Square, and in fact, our guide was from Tiananmen Square. And, um, and I wondered, what about the fourth level that goes wherever? But they told us that they could put everybody in that city underground within 15, 20 minutes. And I was astonished. I went back to see Larry Gershwin at the time, who was uh, one of our lead guys at the C Central Intelligence Agency, and said, Larry, did you know da-da-da-da-da? And he said, well, no, I'll give you to our underground expert. And I went to see him, and he didn't know either. So I think we're probably pretty ignorant on a lot of things. And, uh, of course, that whole world over there has gone underground, and they designed their systems so that they were on the other side of the mountain, if you will, and not really easily targeted by some of our uh, offensive capabilities. Uh, these people are smart. I mean, we, we are foolish if we think we're dealing with a backward, you know, nation catching up. Uh, the fact is they've caught up. I mean, and that really is the issue. And I'm very concerned that they're moving ahead of us, as I said earlier, in space. Um, on our watch, uh, you know, when Reagan 
and I, and I worry that there's a community out there, I mentioned it, the arms control community that says you can, you can keep your safety by negotiations. And maybe negotiations can help, but as Reagan said, trust but verify. And the reason uh, we were able to get the freedom on that F-15 shot was that our conclusion was you can't verify these things in space. We don't have the capabilities to do so. And we're making agreements, and there are communities out there that want us to make additional uh, agreements. And the Chinese and the Russians cry crocodile tears because we don't. And we have a whole community in this country that's responsive to this claim that if we could only talk together and come to agreement, we'd have peace in our time. And this is, uh, you know, it's, um, we, we, um, we don't like to face the facts, the hard facts. And frankly, in this country, some of, some of the public, a lot of the public, uh, a lot of our young people in particular haven't had to face those facts in their lifetime. Uh, what worries me more than anything else is the American people eventually, when they're sort of hit by, in the middle of the head by a two by four, as my dad would have said with the mule, they will pay attention. My worry is, given the 5G technology that we're in the world now, that we're going into, we don't have time to recover from a Pearl Harbor in space. I mean, this is, this is a game for all the marbles. Uh, I think Roger and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Les both are working the economic front. We have a president that's sympathetic to that. Uh, the worry is whether or not he has advisors close to him that can help make it happen. I think, I frankly think it's the most dangerous time of my lifetime, and that includes World War II. I mean, I couldn't fight, but I, I do remember sitting there listening at the radio and, of uh, what was going on, Iwo Jima, wherever else, you know, we were going. Uh, we don't have time to play catch up. But Americans in that era, in three and a half years, went from nothing. I mean, the soldiers <laughs> drilled with broomsticks. I, and, and I remember um, the, the gliders that were used on the landings in Normandy trained on our farmland there near Augusta, Fort Gordon out of Fort Gordon, and um, three and a half years. We can't do that anymore. We don't have three and a half years. If we don't wake up and pay attention to this problem, uh, we're gonna find um, a world, we're gonna leave our grandkids, kids and grandkids out in the cold. I mean, I, I really believe that, sorry. General, thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador, rather. Um, the, the one thing that I just wanted to add in, um, the arms control community uh, that you've alluded to has uh, long maintained that uh, the Chinese have something between 200 and 400 nuclear weapons. And the, and the point that I was trying to get at with this great underground wall is that um, it wasn't Larry Gershwin and the uh, excellent people at the CIA who tumbled to this. There was a professor, friend of ours, by the name of Phil Carber at Georgetown University who put some graduate and undergraduate students on the case, and they came up with this revelation that the Chinese have built 3,000 miles of hardened underground tunnels in which to hide their nuclear arsenal and heavens knows what all else. Uh, <clears throat> it's inconceivable that one would go to that trouble for 200 or 400 warheads. Um, the point is that this is part and parcel of a very, very substantial military as well as uh, uh, other buildup. Um, Frank, could I, if I could just add, I mean, this is not just something that's coming on. This strategy that China is executing is, is a long time strategy. I mean, our friend Michael Pillsbury has written a book, you know, entitled, uh, what is it? The, the 100 year marathon. Hundred, hundred year marathon. They laid it out years ago, and Sun Tzu talked about how you win without fighting years ago, and uh, they, they could very well strangle us without, right. unless we wake well, up. Well, and, and another very seminal book is Unrestricted Warfare, which two People's Liberation Army Chinese colonels published in 1999, describing dozens of ways in which they could, before they got to the point where they had the kinetic strength to take us on the old-fashioned way, 
uh, nonetheless take us down. I, I wanted to ask Dr. Lin a question. Maybe Frank, Roger. can I add something to that, uh, Paul, a little bit? Uh, you, you asked a question of General Rigner uh, about uh, technology transfer, and, and which is spot on. His comments were spot on. But um, uh, intuitively, we don't realize we live in a domain that uh, if, if we're breached, uh, we may never get that Marine Corps vehicle anywhere because we have been shut down. Uh, if, if you look at recently, we, you know, a few years ago, uh, it, it came through North Korea, but who teaches the North Koreans how to breach? Uh, when the, the leader of North Korea didn't like a movie that Sony was producing, they shut Sony down. Um, if, if you look at the complexity of the, the cyber domain, the ability of an adversary to say, I don't believe I want the Marines out of Cherry Point to do anything today. Uh, we have, we've got to come to grips with that. And, and so it is about the combat weapon systems. It is about the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines. But it is really about this digital ecosystem, this connected. So how can we employ the latest fighter? And to, to Ambassador Cooper's comment, if you look at our systems, and this is, you know, it's all open source information, our cell phones are GPS timed, our weapon systems are GPS timed, uh, that comes from space-based vehicles. Uh, if you do something to implicate that GPS timing, you can damage a whole lot of stuff. And, and I was, I'm old enough, and, and our fellow Marine Corps, we learned how to use a lensatic compass. Uh, that's a lost skill set nowadays. <laughs> so, thank you. Shooting the stars and stuff. Um, well, this this is really a, a relevant point. And Hank, I, I I think the next step you might have gotten to, General, is uh, is the grid, which is also we know something that the Chinese have understood is a huge vulnerability to this country and something that can be targeted through a variety of means. Hank, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, well, I'm, al I'm always ready to talk about that. <laughs> uh, how Loaded much do you bear. want? I mean, it, we are, we're totally dependent on electricity in this country. Um, the last time we had a major solar event, a geomagnetic disturbance, GMD it's called, was in 1859. At that time, we were an agrarian society. We had like 10% uh, of the current number of Americans living here. And nobody paid much attention. It, it, it roasted some telegraph cables and so on, but that was a little before uh, Alexander Graham Bell, as I recall, and so on. Um, today we have, uh, you know, 10 times that many people, uh, and we depend on just-in-time delivery of our food. And if you don't have gasoline, which is also pumped by, you know, electricity, they, that's not transported. Without water, hospitals, uh, you know, people start dying within hours. There are serious studies done on this subject. And, uh, and today, the electric power grid of this country is totally vulnerable to attack by a number of means. Cyber is one. Um, the solar thing is going to happen one day. We're vulnerable to that, too. It's just a matter of when. I don't know how they do the calculations. I wouldn't know how to do it, but it is alleged that there's a 12% chance per year, per decade, I guess it is, that we'll have another Carrington event. That's what that was called. And, um, and so it's just a matter of time in any case when that happens. Uh, if you blow a nuclear weapon, detonate it high in the atmosphere or in outer space above uh, the Earth, which now can be done by, by uh, Russia, China, North Korea, and I believe Iran, although people, the intelligence community doesn't, doesn't say that, but I, I, I have serious suspicion that they also have that capability. They could shut down the grid for an indefinite period of time, and the estimates of a congressional EMP commission is that uh, up to 90% of the American people would perish within a year, long, due to the chaos and so on, not nuclear effects 
or any of those other things, but just because we've lost electricity. So this is a serious problem, and we're ignoring it. Um, the president uh, uh, signed out an executive order last March, uh, uh, March I believe it was, in 19, and then thanks to Ron Johnson, it was strengthened uh, in the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, that was in December of last year, and now the government is supposed to be getting sacked together. Frankly, I am concerned that they're going to reinvent the wheel because we learned about this threat in the 60s, and when I was at the Air Force Weapons Laboratory, we were busily hardening our strategic systems, uh, Minuteman, the submarine, the communication systems, the B-52 in those days. Uh, and subsequent strategic aircraft and the means for the president to survive and communicate with all this and tack them all with respect to the, the Navy submarines and so on. Ba based now, on actual experience. Based with on actual experience and testing. Events. And the last test we did in the atmosphere uh, was shortly after that because I had worked at Bell Labs actually in 62 and worked on Telstar, if you remember what that was. That was our first telecommunication satellite. We lost it, and along with other half the other satellites because of that high altitude burst, and then we went into an atmospheric test ban. That was uh, among the last of the tests. The Russians, by the way, Soviets, did a much better scientific set of tests than we did. And we have learned and adapted that information. But the bureaucracy in Washington has refused to accept the analysis and support of the EMP Commission and the Department of Energy and God love them, our national laboratories and out, all out there see this as a, a money trough and they're out there to reinvent what we learned how to do decades ago and can do and we've proven that now up in Rock Hill and York County, the cost for protecting the distribution grid and without going into details is $100 per citizen of York County to protect their grid. That's a one-time cost, one-time cost. The average citizen uh, family in York County pays several times that amount every month for their health insurance. I mean, it is absurd that we're not doing what we learned how to do for our military systems decades ago to protect our critical civil infrastructure, which we ignored throughout the period. And we have a regulatory world um, that is problematic. Uh, I recently learned how important the public utility companies are, um, commissions are, and there are six commissioners here in South Carolina. Every congressional district has its own commissioner, and that's on my list next to try to understand and convince, because they're the ones who determine whether Duke Energy or Dominion now or Santee Cooper here in South Carolina are really going to take this threat seriously because of the rate business and the politics that surrounds all that. I read that Duke is going to spend some $54 billion, I believe it was, last yesterday. I was sent that article, and uh, I sent it to my friends at Duke who have been working with me up in York County and uh, said, what do you know about this? And the guy <laughs> I sent it to didn't know anything, so they're going this to figure that out. This is spending on... Spending on the other electric Other than hardening grid. the... Uh, uh, I don't know what it's being spent yeah. on, but $54 billion is not I a think, small I think it's bit of change. It. If and, I'm not mistaken. Right. So I don't know that they're doing what I want to do, but, but they're serious about protecting the grid and probably going to, uh, not, uh, to um, uh, you know, the, what do you call it, the solar and wind and all of that stuff because renewables. they're political renewables. That's right. the word I was looking for. And, um, and I have to tell you, I think that's a serious mistake from a technical point of view. Mr. Anyway. Ambassador, thank you. <laughs> Um, that was more than you wanted. No, I'm no, sure. it's it's <laughs> just what I wanted. Let me ask, um, uh, if I could, Dr. Lin. Um, this may be a little out of area, but I'd, I'd like you to to respond uh, within your expertise. One of the things that we've been told by um, a fellow by the name of Larry Fink, who is a big figure in Wall Street. Uh, at the Davos conference that uh, his firm, which is BlackRock, is uh, 
no longer going to place a premium on investments for return on investment. They're now going to be giving priority to environment, social governance, and uh, social justice, rather, mm -hmm. and, and governance mm -hmm. issues, ESG, as it's called. And um, the question that, that I wanted you to just to parse for me is, if that is the priority of this company that manages a trillion dollars or something under uh, in its portfolio, um, including the thrift savings plan of the United States, the last time I checked, the federal retirement system for gentlemen like you, um, and yet Larry Fink is also one of the drivers towards investing in China, including in military personnel and government employees' pension funds. Am I right that the government of China is not good on the environment, not good on social justice, and not good on governance with respect to its companies either? How, how would those match up with your experience of China? Well, you are absolutely correct. Uh, China, Chinese government's the words actually in the whole world regarding about the environment, social justice, and governance, right? So for environment issues, uh, for, for decades, even before uh, the opening of China's economies and for, for trades, even before that, the Communist Party ruined so much on the Chinese landscape. And there are so many political movements and even uh, take down the forests in many of the hills. So now even you, you can still see in, in China so many uh, uh, lands on the north, uh, on the uh, northwest, uh, they are just naked mountains, naked hill. And even nowadays, if you look at the Google Maps, you can see in China how pathetic on the uh, forest coverage is primarily on the east, southeast, on this land. And so many land was, you know, un, uh, agri it's not good for agriculture, not for, good for farming as well. And, and China's uh, river is so heavily polluted. And <laughs> it's interesting, the Chinese government even manipulate the standard of the water qualities. And uh, for the Yangtze River, <laughs> some many many region actually based on standard uh, quality measures, it should be like quarter uh, the scale of five is the one of the worst water uh, pollution qualities. But the government changed their standard now; it can be uh, level three. You know, so it's, the government's even still cheating the Chinese people on how terrible the environment issue it is. And, uh, and I, you know, even didn't mention about the uh, the coal industry in the Sanxi province. So many miners actually were killed in a collapse, and so many pollution. You know, China is one of the biggest contributor for carbon dioxide, right? And so this is coal just, plants, yeah, coal, on, like, yeah, right. so much on there, right. yeah. And then social justice, and you you probably know Chinese government even building the social credit system, even using the surveillance technology to tracking on individuals. And, and if you if you are distant from the Chinese government, you cannot even get on the train. You cannot probably buy, buy a ticket. Uh, you know, so you you are heavily monitored, and and you have to fit into government standards so that you can have a normal life, basically. And so, how how good is this social credit systems? And also for governance, and the example of the uh, handling the coronavirus is just an example. And, there are so many measures, from, even from preventive measures, medicine aspect, from epidem epidemiology aspect. You can, there are so many measures you can take to uh, contain the situation before you suddenly take a draconian measure to sh lock down a whole city with more than 15 million people. Right, so, uh, but Chinese government, to them, what is most critical is to show to Chinese people or show the world they have, they have the. Oh, mighty power, they can control the society, they can show to the Chinese people, they try all the measures to contain the situation, so it should prove their political right, and, and regardless how many Chinese people die because of the wrong measures. So that's the nature. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's a, a hypocritical uh, uh, sort of gambit on the part of uh, Mr. Fink and, and others like him, I think. Roger, I, you may want to comment on this, but I, I would like to ask you one other thing, too, while you're doing it. Um, 
a congressman by the name of Jim Banks from Indiana has written one of the governors that uh, Mike Pompeo, I believe, was addressing the other day and warning about what China is up to and the penetration of their states and the uh, difficulty that that will create for the national security as well as for their states. Um, Governor Newsom, about a fellow by the name of Yu Ben Meng. Tell us a little bit about Mr. Meng and the role that he is currently playing and why Congressman Banks thinks it's rather problematic. Yeah, well, first on, on BlackRock, I think that they may, my recollection is that the largest asset manager in the United States, uh, arguably the largest in the world. Uh, so Larry Fink's comments about giving ESG, as it's called, priority over investment returns is a big deal. Uh, now the question is, how sincere is it? You know, when we hear the word social justice, a fundamental piece of that is what I would consider human rights. Uh, BlackRock runs the exchange-traded funds, uh, many of them, that, that are the investment vehicles for indexes like the MSCI All Country World, XUS Index, and even the MSCI Emerging Market Index that we've talked about earlier that's 33% weighted uh, with Chinese securities. Uh, I never heard Larry Fink talk about human rights and national security concerns. Uh, surely they have to figure in as material risks uh, every bit as much as the environment. I mean, if we're saving the environment while we gut our fundamental values on human rights and we ignore our national security, which sort of makes the environment go away, so to speak, uh, if we uh, don't protect ourselves adequately, uh, here's, uh, here are the roots of potential hypocrisy. Now, the jury may still be out uh, on this. It's just a recent set of remarks. But uh, I, myself, am skeptical uh, that we're going to see human rights and national security concerns surface here. And there's an excellent set of tests uh, because BlackRock is in a position uh, to do something about this that would be truly uh, reshaping the landscape of Wall Street if it were sincere. That's a big if, that putting it generously. So we, the, so we will see and we will monitor uh, BlackRock and Mr. Fink. Uh, as far as Mr. Meng is concerned, I'm not an expert on his situation except to say that that uh, I understand that he was with CalPERS. He went back to China for three, three and a half years. And CalPERS looked, being the California Public Employment Retirement yes, System? Yes, my apologies. Um, this is a world of acronyms. Uh, but CalPERS, as you know, is the biggest public pension system uh, of the 50 states. And uh, they have $370 billion under management. Uh, he went back to be, I think, number two at an acronym, again, called SAFE, S-A-F-E, which was, in effect, the $3 trillion reserves of China. That is, the management of their entire reserve structure. Now, that's a big job, uh, obviously, and fundamental to China's well-being. I'm also told, or there are published reports, that he was part of the Thousand Talents program. I once read a quote from the FBI about the Thousand Talents program, and such a quotes, ex I mean, such statements do exist by the Bureau, that they view that as a vehicle of espionage, very much like the Confucius Institute uh, that still is embedded in part of uh, the University of. S South Carolina, as I understand it. So these are vehicles of China uh, to recruit the brightest and the best and bring them into China, but very importantly, send them back 
to the United States. Uh, the, this is an individual who talked about his pride in serving the motherland or being supportive of the motherland uh, to people's daily. Uh, does that mean that he's proud to, to serve in the capacity as chief investment officer of the California Public Employees Retirement System? I don't know. Uh, it remains to be seen, doesn't it? Uh, I certainly think that it's worth checking uh, under his stewardship whether the level of exposure to Chinese securities might be rising. Uh, these are questions. And whether we're going to see the kind of rigorous human rights and national security related material risk diligence that we've been referring to in a good part of today's proceedings. I have my doubts. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the continued challenges we face as we finally, at long last, uncover uh, the financial dimension of this equation uh, with its vast implications. Roger, thank you. Uh, we're just about at the end of our time. I did want to just invite each of you to say a word about having described at length now the nature of the problem, and I think having, uh, between all of these wonderful experts, uh, given a fairly rich characterization of its many faceted character. If you had one thing that you would recommend our government do about the problems that you've identified, um, perhaps the macro problem rather than the specific problems that each of you have discussed in more detail, what would that be? General Eisen, may I start with you? We've got to educate our national and local leaders of the complexity of the 21st century problem. Uh, uh, the technology that we're all, we all we live with and we enjoy the convenience of uh, is a horizontal penetrator integrator into a vertical bureaucracy world, and we've got to we've got to get uh, the local, state, and federal verticals to collaborate, and we've got to better educate our leadership of uh, this is a solvable problem, but every day we don't solve it, it's going to become more difficult to solve. Uh, and the, China, the communist Chinese government are not our friends. A key point. Um, Ambassador Cooper, we were just asking each of you to offer a thought, uh, whether it's with specific reference to something you've discussed or at the macro level, um, what you would recommend we do to try to address these threats from China. Press your mic. First of all, um, do a little reading, get on top of this issue. Bill Gertz has a very good book out. I've heard, do you remember the title of the book? I don't. Hopefully I don't, I but anyway, look up Bill Gertz. Uh, fantastic reporter who writes about this. I already mentioned Michael Pillsbury. There's nothing new about this threat. Uh, the Chinese have uh, planned to take over the world from for a long time, uh, and we've been asleep while this is going on. Um, I, one other comment I have to make, regrettably, is that I consider the federal system to be completely broken when it comes to dealing with this issue. Um, and, I, and I really do regret to say that. Um, and so I think it's terribly important that the citizens of um, South Carolina, since this is my original home state, but every state for that matter, educate themselves, figure out what it takes to deal with the issues, um, inform their, uh, their own opinion of what it takes to deal with the issues. Uh, go see your congressman and make, make sure that they recognize their seats on the line. Uh, you've got an election coming up, a national election. If there is a way for South Carolinians to influence that uh, by getting involved in getting their, rep their, whether they're Democrat or Republican, whoever it is that's running, um, put them on the spot. 
how, how, how will they deal with this issue? First of all, do they understand that this is an issue? Uh, I, I fear that most Americans don't really understand and they're ignorant of the problem. And the first thing I learned as an engineer that you have to do uh, if you want to solve something is you have to understand the problem. Uh, and unfortunately, trying to wait on Washington to do it and regrettably even our legislators here in Columbia to do it for you, um, it, it uh, is a recipe for stagnation, I fear, uh, because there's so much ignorance in the system. I, I, don't, I, I hesitate to blame people. I think they're largely uninformed, and those who are informed uh, have bad news to share, and they, the others don't want to listen. They're a minority. And well, that's, that's why that's we're here, though, sir. And I uh, appreciate so that's, much your participation. Right. In it. Thank General you. Regner? Uh, yes, sir. I'd say that a uh, good friend of yours, uh, former Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Jim Jones, yep. former National Security Advisor, said to me one time, National Security helps provide economic stability. I believe that. I believe that if we follow the national defense strategy laid out by General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, a couple of years ago, that talks a lot about the threat that we've addressed today. <clears throat> I will say the national defense strategy or national security strategy also talks about and empowers building our partner capacity because America cannot do it alone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Roger Robinson. Stop the preferential treatment being accorded China over their American corporate counterparts in our capital markets. Force compliance of Chinese enterprises with U.S. federal securities laws and SEC regulations, uh, particularly with respect to the, the material risks that must be disclosed uh, associated with uh, the risk to share value and corporate reputation of those Chinese companies and those that invest in them, uh, from corporate national security and human rights abusers, disallow uh, U.S. sanctioned companies, uh, or, or sorry, U.S. sanctioned Chinese uh, enterprises from being listed or traded in, in the U.S. capital markets and basically stop index providers from loading up the American people's portfolios with Chinese bad actors. And finally, don't permit any level of, of significant dependency of 150 plus million Americans on Chinese securities in their retirement accounts and investment portfolios that's coming up in the next two to three years and make sure that we're not in checkmate with a China lobby so vast as to be out of our control. Thank you, Roger. Dr. Lin? Uh, besides draining the money pocket from the uh, evil empire, I think it's also very important to realize the Chinese regime is not as strong as they appear. And so we actually see a huge uh, observing of uh, increase of the Chinese people coming out of the Great Firewall to seek true information. So my recommendation is the United States government need to support uh, internet gadget company that can help Chinese people jump over the Great Firewall to seek information. Because Chinese government's ruling really depends on deceiving the Chinese people. Uh, so I think that's very important. And I also hope the history won't repeat again, because in the 1960s, uh, 70s, when Communist Party almost on the brink of collapse, Nixon and Kissinger's reach a friendly hands, and the result is Chinese people suffer another four or five decades under the Communist regime. So I hope this history won't repeat. Thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me just add a couple of thoughts of my own. Uh, it seems to me that taking a page out of the Reagan playbook for defeating the evil empire 1.0, I guess we're dealing with 2.0 at the moment, uh, delegitimize the Chinese Communist Party. This is for the reasons that most especially you've discussed, Dr. Lin, a terrible blight on a billion plus people, to say nothing of a threat to the rest of us. And it should be treated as such, rather than 
propped up for sure, or even simply regarded as uh, just another nation, or perhaps arguably one of the most important of nations. Um, we've talked about this connecting from supply chains that are clearly dangerous. That has to be done. Um, I think particularly and most urgently with respect to the medical supply. Um, again, an, another Reagan very important priority was enhancing our deterrent, both the nuclear and the conventional and the asymmetric, because this is the way to uh, hopefully prevent something very bad from happening with China with all of these weapons and other capabilities that it is amassing. And finally, I think it's kind of implicit in a lot of what we've been saying here, but um, it, it needs to be made very explicit and, and thought carefully through because we have had some bad experience with it. But we're up against a nation and a regime that has not only stolen our technology, but trained many of their best and brightest in our institutions, including here in Colombia, and now begun in earnest, as you were saying, General Eisner, to apply those skills and technologies to acquiring capabilities uh, that will require us to innovate much more aggressively and assiduously. And we need to get our hands around what that will take to do and to get about it um, on a whole host of fronts. So with that, let me simply lastly say, we did a poll uh, sponsored by the Committee on the Present Danger China um, that is available at our website, as will be this video and all of the others that we have uh, produced over the past year or so. Uh, it was conducted by one of the best polling firms in the United States, McLaughlin and Associates. And what it demonstrates, I think in very conclusive terms, by sampling the opinions of a thousand likely voters, is that the American people are with us. In issue after issue, question after question, the kinds of things, the common sense responses to the challenges that we've described here today are very clearly what the majority, and I'm talking about really substantial majorities in case after case after case aspire to, what they prefer, what they want, what they seek, what they are expecting from their leaders. And the interesting thing about this poll, again, it's available at presentdangerchina.org, is that that's true across virtually every demographic subgroup. There's an amazing unanimity. So I think what this says to all of us is good news, that the people of this country, especially the more they know, the more they're educated about China and the dangers that it poses, the more they're on the right side in terms of safeguarding, yes, our precious seed corn in general, but also the rest of our population and our country, which we, of course, uh, love dearly. I want to thank all of you who've been watching this program, and as well, um, Representative Clemens, who had to get back to work. We're very appreciative of his sponsorship of our appearance here in the state capitol complex of uh, the state of South Carolina. We hope this will be informative and contribute to decisions that the people of South Carolina will be making here shortly about our next commander in chief and that uh, the rest of our countrymen and women will benefit from this kind of educational symposium and we will be doing more of it in the days ahead in Nevada and in Texas and beyond. Thank you very much for your attention today. Check this all out at presentdangerchina.org. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Well done. Well Good done. <laughs>